verse 1. And as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold unto the next day, for it was not even tied. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the man was about five thousand. And it came to pass on the morrow that the rulers and elders and scribes, and Annas the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest, were gathered together at Jew Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have ye done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the important men, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doeth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were unwarned and ignorant men, they marveled, and they took knowledge of them, that they had been with Jesus. And beholding the man which was healed, standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But that is spread no further among the people. Let us straightly threaten them, that they speak henceforth to no man in this name, and they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had no further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which was done. For the men was above forty years old, on whom the miracle of healing was showed. And being let go, they went to their own company, and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord, and said, Lord, thou art guard, God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is then is. Who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage, and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord, and against his Christ. For of all truth against the holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pietus Pilate, with the Gentiles, and the people of Israel were gathered together. For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before it to be done. Now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word, by stretching forth thy hand to heal, and the signs and wonders may be done by the name of the holy child, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that ought of the things which he possessed was his own. But they had all things common. And with great power, power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And gave grace was upon them. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of land, or houses, sold them, 
and brought the prices of the things that were sold. And, lay, and they laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distributed was made unto every man according as he had need. And chose who be the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of the consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. All right, Acts chapter 4 there. Thank you, Jamie. Acts chapter 4. We're talking about we cannot but speak. We cannot but speak. In verse 2 it says, Being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection of the dead. Here the people are greatly grieved, specifically the religious leaders, yes. But we know that as we go out into our lives, many people, not just religious folks, uh, not just young, not just old, but all types become grieved when the Word of God is taught. And yet today you'll find in, in the world that young and old are being taught that, that, that the proud are happy. They're being taught that, that gay is okay. They're being taught that it's, it's all right to identify as this gender or that gender. Just pick whichever one you like. My body, my choice. Right, it's a cry you'll often hear, but you know that doesn't apply when you don't want to be vaccinated. No, now it's the government's body and their choice whether or not they put those things in you. They're, they're being taught that, that pedophilia actually is another orientation. This is gradually getting and coming into the world and being taught by, by the public schools and, and by the, the media at, at large. And, and they're taught that each one of these different ideas are something that needs tolerance, it needs love, it needs acceptance, and more than that, it needs conformity. They want everybody to believe the same things. Everything is fluid. There is no truth. There, no, there is no absolute. There is no moral standard that applies above everybody that is the guideline, that is the, the verity, that is the way, the truth, of life. Nobody wants that, but you've got to conform to this newfangled type of just fluidity where anything goes. When this world wants everything to be accepted, it's, it's natural that the one thing that is completely exclusive, which is the entry into heaven, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ, is naturally rejected. Today, you can teach anything you would like. You, you, can, you can put it out in, in, into the public fool system. You can put it out into be broadcast in, in social media, you can broadcast it through Hollywood, you can broadcast it for the world to hear. But there's one thing that isn't, and that's in verse 2 there. It says, the people, they preached through Jesus the resurrection of the dead. This is the one thing that is taboo. The one thing that you can't mention. The one thing that is shunned. Verse 7 says, and when they had set them in the midst, being the disciples, they asked, by what name, what power, by what name have you done this? The only thing that they were upset about here seemingly was that they taught in the name of Jesus and where is your authority to do such things? This is the major problem that the world has. But we cannot but speak the things which we have seen. And it's so much the more that you see in verse 3 it says, And they laid their hands on them and put them in hold to the next day, for it was now eventide. For standing up in front of people, proclaiming the truth of Jesus, simply that he was resurrected from the dead, one of the most basic tenets of Christian learning, of Christian understanding, of the Christian belief, is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's one of the very foundational truths and one that you would expect to be least offensive. They're not coming to the world and talking about the reprobate doctrine. They're not coming to the world and saying that marriage is between a man and a woman, these hot button issues. I think, I think that it's coming the day that those won't even be the hot issues. The hot issue will be whether or not you have believed in Jesus Christ. That will be lifted up as the most offensive, the most hateful, the most despised, the most just despicable message to the world is that there is only one way to heaven. There is only one truth that gets you there. Verse four, uh, chapter four, verse twelve. 
Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There it is, hate speech. There it is, the offense of the world. There it is, the, the most hateful and despised message in the world's eyes. And that day is coming. Yet yeah, today we can raise John 3.16 at a football game. We can give that to people on the bottom of a coffee cup. But the day is coming that that message, that there is no salvation in any other name but that of Jesus. There is no other way that men can be saved other than through Jesus will be looked at as hateful and as the worst kind of hate. But we cannot but speak the things which we have saw. In verse 13 it says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. And the reality is, is that the gospel message isn't one for smarty pants. It isn't one for, for great theologians. It's basic Christian doctrine. So they looked upon Peter and John seeing their boldness and thought, how can these men be so bold? They're ignorant. They're foolish. They're unlearned. They're just fishermen. They're, they're, just, they're just your run-of-the-mill factory worker. They're just your lowly peasant. He perceived, and they perceived that they were ignorant and unlearned, and they marveled. But here it says, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Doesn't being with Jesus make you different? Even though being with Jesus is the thing that is most hated and most shunned, it's also the most thing that is easily recognizable in the sight of the world. Verse 16 says, saying, what shall we do to these men? For indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest unto all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But that it spread no further among the people. And here's the rub. Here's, here's the purpose that they have set forward. Here's why they grabbed them and threw them in prison. Here's why they're bringing them before the councils. But that this spread no further among the people. Let us straightly threaten them. That they speak henceforth to no man in this name. And that's the name of Jesus Christ. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus Christ. But believers, we can't help but speak this plain truth, this simple gospel message for the love of God constrains us. We can't help but let this thing out. And yet the world despises, rejects it, shuns it. Now recently in church, uh, the church email address, I received um, an email, and I won't go into what the contents of the email were specifically, but it dealt with specifically a mother who deemed it inappropriate that a gospel preacher would speak with her unaccompanied child in a park. Okay, so this was the thrust of the message. I'm offended by the fact it is inappropriate that a man would come and speak unto my children, my unaccompanied children in this park. Now my intent is to deal with this concept publicly and maybe learn something from it. So I'm just going to give you my response, okay? Thank you for taking the time to write and to voice your concerns. I'd like to share some of my own. I would not expect that unaccompanied children would be left in such a vulnerable state were they not mature enough and prepared to handle themselves. In the day and age we live in, you should count yourself blessed that a gospel preacher encountered your child when he was left alone instead of drug dealers and perverts. Okay, I wish that parents would use more discretion. I know our church members are careful and wise to situations that come up. At the door, we always ask if parents are home and get permission to preach to the children if they are. If they are not home, we leave. If they are home and we don't have permission, we also leave. When we by chance happen to run into use in public spaces, we usually presume that the parents have armed their children with the wisdom to take care of themselves, or we assume that they don't even care about their children, else why would they be alone? If conversation happens, we keep it strictly to the gospel of Jesus Christ, never stay longer than a few minutes, and are always mindful to ensure that other people are around and that the space is very public. This is for our safety and the child's, of course. We care for children and have the utmost respect for parents that care for them as well. Some verses to think on. Mark 10, verse 13 to 15. And they brought young children to him, 
that he should touch them. And his disciples rebuked those that brought them. When Jesus saw it, he was much displeased and said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. Jesus found it of utmost importance that the children be reached. Mark chapter 16 and verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into the world and preach the gospel to every creature, not just adults. Matthew chapter 16, 18 and verse 6. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depths of the sea. People that hurt children or cause them to offend from following after Jesus deserve the punishment shown here in the very least. I will remind our people again the importance of what I wrote here and will bring the concern to their attention. I hope you will also consider what was written. And the reality is, is what is the offense? I mean, we see children in public, and of course, we are going to have discretion. Of course, we are going to be mindful of these things. But it still remains, and you can turn to Amos chapter 7, it still remains that we cannot help, we cannot but speak the truth of the gospel. When we're out preaching the truth of the gospel, when we get opportunities to preach the group, the truth of the gospel. Now, we need to take something like this, because this is a, a perception of the world, okay? But and we need to be reminded of carefulness when we're preaching to children. This is a good way for us to learn some things. And as I promised, I'm bringing it to the church's attention, okay? First thing we need to do, and I know that many of us are, are, are doing this already, if you come to the door and the children answer the door, the first thing we always do is ask for the parents. Are your parents home? Can I speak with your parents, right? And then if the parents come or they don't want to talk or I've had it where the, the parents are like, yeah, 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 I would ask maybe through the window or wherever I could, is, is it possible? Can I preach the gospel to your children? Sometimes they say yes, sometimes they say no. We need to be respectful of that, that decision that's made by the parent. Ask the parents first. Get permission to speak to the children. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 1 and 2 says, The heir differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all. And what this is saying is that the heir, in other words, the prince, the young child that is going to inherit the great power and wealth and responsibility of the kingdom, perhaps, or of the business or whatever, the heir differeth nothing from a servant when he is small. In other words, the child is under authority. And that authority is such that we need to respect it. Colossians 3 and verse 22 says, Servants, okay, and this is just like the air, right? Servants, obey in all things your masters. The same thing is said in verse 19. Children, obey your parents in all things. And so as Christians, we need to understand the parental roles and responsibilities and how their um, particular authority plays out, right? Parents obey, or children obey the parents. Parents obey God. If they don't have a God, well, hey, I guess they're their own highest authority. But we as Christians need to respect and yield to the proper authorities placed before you. Now, a note for moms and dads, right? For anyone who may be hearing this or for future mom and dads that are here in this room. If you don't approve of your children doing X, Y, and Z, if you specifically don't approve of your children talking with preachers, talking to any kind of strangers in the park or whatever, best teach them how to deal with that. Best teach them how to say no thank you. Best teach them how to, how to deal with these certain situations and not just leave your children to their own devices so that they would get caught up in something that you don't agree with. The better thing that you could do is just be with your children and then you're not going to even have this problem. But the reality is, is I believe that, it, that it to be the truth. When I go to a park and I see children all by themselves, I assume either the children are aware of what their parents believe and what their parents want them to do and have strict orders as to how to handle the situations that are in. I believe either that's the case, they're mature, they're ready, they can be alone because mom and dad say it's okay, or the second is true, the parents just don't give a rip about their kids and they'll just let them do whatever they want. 
And quite often in this day and age, people just don't give a rip about their kids, or they're not aware of the danger that's out there, or they're ignorant to, and they're avoiding, they're covering their ears, and they're putting their head in the sand, and they don't want to know that this world is getting worse and worse and worse. And I agree that the, that, that person should be thankful that a gospel preacher ran into them and not some pervert and not some drug dealer and not some who knows what could happen. So we need to, as Christians, yes, ask the parents first, respect the authority over top of those children. The next thing we need to do is, again, like I said, keep to the topic at hand. In 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 2, it says, For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So we need to, when we go to a situation where we may be preaching to children, or, or pretty much any gospel situation where we get, get to present the gospel, just be mindful of the fact that you need to determine to know nothing except for Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And this is a great way of dealing with children in public or children at their parents' door, is to just stick to the topic at hand. Jesus Christ and Him crucified. We also have to be mindful of our illustrations, right? Because when we go to a door and we find some older gentleman or some older lady, we're going to start talking about suicide, about the drinking and driving, about the, the you know, ruining your life and becoming a drug addict and then killing somebody in a car, would you still go to heaven? We use all of these illustrations, but we need to be mindful of the fact that, that in the presence of, of the world's children, we, we need to reel some of those in, especially with kids. I mean, kids understand very simple things. You know, if you were to do something really bad, like steal a cookie from the cookie jar, would you still go to heaven? I mean, they think that's like the worst thing that they could do. And so it brings it to their context, and they're going to understand. Adults, it's a little bit different. Usually we'll bring them to something like suicide, because then they can understand, oh, that's a really bad thing. And then you can get them on the trail of eternal security and understand that even if you did something rotten, you could still be saved by believing on Jesus. Jesus. So we need to, like I said, be respectful of the authority, ask the parents permission first, if the parent is present, right? We need to keep to the topic at hand. And the next thing is, like in these park situations, when you're there and there's no parents seemingly in, for miles and, and there's nothing going, give space, okay, and ensure that there are other witnesses present, okay? This is, this is just a wise thing to do. If you're going to address a child in public, stand way back, make sure there's other children around, be with somebody else, have some accountability, have some witnesses there that there's a conversation taking place. Because First Thessalonians 5 verse 22 says, abstain from all appearance of evil, and I understand that the world is a wicked place. And yeah, it can be a little strange to see an adult talking to a child. Unfortunately, though, we were just talking about this the other day. When I go to parks, because the parents don't care and they're nowhere to be seen, and the children are starving for attention from some sort of authority, some sort of adult figure, I'll just be playing with Caleb and get into conversations with little kids. It happens all the time because these kids don't have their parents to talk to because they're off texting or playing on their phones, or maybe they're even at home. They're no way in sight. So sometimes we get into these conversations. Sometimes we get into these uncomfortable situations. We need to learn to use discretion. Give space. Have the conversation, but have it not be something where there's an appearance of evil. But this all brings us back to the real problem of the exchange that was mentioned in this email. And it's the fact that parents... They generally don't care. They don't care about all the junk that Hollywood's telling them. They don't care about all the junk that the TV is telling their children. They don't care about what their teachers are telling them. They don't care about what the school system's telling them, what the kids in the playground are telling them. They, they don't care about all the junk that's being fed into their children and the teachers destroying these little children's minds and, and the Hollywood destroying these children's minds, corrupting them. They don't care. That's not the problem. The problem is always the Word of God. But we can't help but speak those things. We can't help but speak those things. The Word of God is always the problem. And all the way back in Amos chapter 7, this is highlighted in verse 10. It says, Then Amaziah the priest of Bethel sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos hath conspired against thee in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos saith, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel shall surely be led away captive out of their own land. Also Amaziah said unto Amos, O thou seer, go, 
Flee thee away into the land of Judah, and there eat bread, and prophesy there. Amos was completely within his writing, within the context of the command of God to do what he was doing. And yet it was rejected by the false prophet Amaziah here, the priest of Bethel, to the point where he said, hey, he's saying all these negative things about the kingdom. He's saying all these truths contained in the word of God, these prophecies, and we don't like it. But then he goes further because it almost seems like nothing was done in that case. And he takes his message directly to the preacher and he says, hey, just go and preach somewhere else. Just go and preach to somebody else. Go and do the same thing. Fine, leave it alone. I'll, I'll let you. But go to Judah. Eat bread there. Prophesy there. Now what was the response of the preacher who was commanded to preach this message at that appointed time in that particular place to that person? His response was this in verse 14. Then answered Amos and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, Neither was I a prophet's son, but I was a herdman and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. Do you know what he's saying here? He's like, I'm just some guy, okay? I'm, I'm just a farmer. I'm just a laborer. I'm just a gatherer. I'm just a herdman. There's nothing special about me. But God called me with this message. And that's what it says in verse 15. And the Lord took me as I followed the flock. In other words, as I was going about my daily business, as I was going about my routine. And the Lord said unto me, Go, prophesy unto my people Israel. The command was clear. It was, hey, as you're going, Amos, as you're performing your daily task, as you're doing your duty as a herdman, a gatherer, a laborer, following the flock, go and prophesy unto this people Israel. And then the naysayer, then the, the one condemning him, then the false prophet comes and says, just go and preach it elsewhere. Go and preach it somewhere else. He also says, don't, don't preach those things. Stop preaching that message. The response was right because Amos was doing what we all do. The best I can tell from the email, it was just a scenario where someone was doing exactly what God had commanded them. As they were in the park, as they were in the highways, as they were in the hedges, as they were going to work, as they were going on the bus, as they were traveling about, doing their daily tasks, they prophesied unto the people that were around them. Okay? The response is, I just did what God told me to do. I am a nobody. Verse 16, now therefore hear, and here's the warning, here's the threatening, here's the danger. It shouldn't be coming at the preacher, the person that's trying to stop the preacher needs to take notice of this. Now therefore hear thou the word of the Lord, okay? They didn't like the word of the Lord, how it came out the first time. They wanted the word of the Lord to go somewhere else. They've rejected the word of the Lord, and look what happens. The word of the Lord comes stronger at them. Thou sayest, prophesy not against Israel, and drop not thy word against the house of Isaac, Therefore, thus saith the Lord, thy wife shall be an harlot in the city, and thy sons and thy daughters shall fall by the sword, and thy land shall be divided by line, and thou shalt die in a polluted land, and Israel shall surely go into captivity forth of this land. Pretty much the worst prophecy ever just came back in this man's face, only now it is more personal. Now it's not just the captivity that's going to happen of Israel. Now it's that his wife would be a harlot. Now that it's that his children would die by the sword. Now the danger and threatening is from the very word of God, and this is a warning. When somebody is going and just about their business preaching the word of God, best that they know how and being as discreet as they know how and being as proper as they know how and somebody comes to them and says hey stop doing that go do that somewhere else the risk is that the same proclamation which what we what do we do when we go and we preach the word of god we give a condemnation first right we say hey hell is to pay for those who do not believe in jesus christ we give a warning right and then what follows after that is the good news if you're going to stop people from hearing the good news as they tried to do in acts when they tried to stop people from hearing of the resurrection of jesus christ then what fell upon them was the doom prophesied and it was more personal and that's what clearly happened here in Amos. And you go back to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 4 and verse 19, you're going to see that Peter had the exact same response that Amos had so many years ago. And that was basically, hey, I'm just doing what God wants me to do. And i got to keep doing what God wants me to do. And because you're hindering me, 
Here's the proclamation of God's truth now personally pointed at you. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 19, after Peter finds himself uh, thrown in prison, after Peter has had that charge given to him that they called him and communicated unto him and commanded him not to speak at all nor teach in the name of the Lord Jesus, Peter's response in verse 19, but Peter and John answered and said unto them, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. The response is, I've seen, I bear witness, I've testified of these truths time and time and time again. And this is what God wants me to do. And you're saying, don't do that. You're going to stand in the way of the command of God, of the work of God. You're now going to hinder God's position, God's point, God's purpose in my life by saying, quit doing those things. Well, what's right? What do you think's right? Should I listen to you, old man, or should I obey God? And his response is, I can't but speak the things which we have seen and heard. I can't cease to preach the truth contained in the scriptures. Acts chapter 5 and verse 12, they do it again. It says, And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. And of the rest there's no man joined himself to them, but the people magnified them. And believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes both of men and women, insomuch they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. There came also a multitude out of the cities, round about unto Jerusalem, being sick folks, and them which were vexed with unclean spirits. And they were healed, everyone. This is a great thing that is happening. There's great healings taking place. People are getting saved. Believers are added to the Lord. Multitudes, both of men and women. The preachers here, uh, the apostles, they're, they're preaching, they're healing, they're preaching, they're healing, they're helping those that are sick. Even passing by, overshadowing some of the Spirit so strong upon them that they're being healed by the very presence of the apostles, and yet people hate that. Why? Because it's being done in Jesus' name. Now you can go out and you could heal a bunch of people at some poor village and you could save a bunch of people from their poverty and from their hunger and give them food and do all sorts of things. And the world will applaud you. The world will recognize that and say it's a great thing. But here, the healing is forever. The salvation lasts to eternity. It's done in Jesus' name and they hate that because that's the response. Verse 17 says, And then the high priest rose up, and all they that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation, and laid their hands on the apostles, and put them in the common prison. They did it again. They grabbed the disciples, they grabbed the apostles, and they tossed them into prison. But what they're missing when they come at the preacher, what they're missing when they try to silence the word, is that this was God's desire that they would do these things. This was God's very command that they would do these things. And verse 19 shows just how important it is to God. Verse 19, But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go, stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. They're thrown in prison. They're told to stop preaching. They preach it anyways. They're thrown into prison again. They're trying to silence the message. And God wants it to go forward so much that he busts the doors open by the hand of his angel, brings them forth and says, go stand and speak. That was why they got thrown into jail. He says, go stand and speak in the temple to the people. All the words of this life. All the words. Don't cut some of the words out. Don't preach a different message. Don't bring this message in a different way. And where did he say to take it? To the people. All the people. Every person needs to hear this message. And this is why God says, go stand and speak in the temple. Go and be sure that this is proclaimed from the house stops. Verse 21, it begins and says, And when they heard that, they entered into the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest came, and they which were with him, and called the council together, and all the senate of the children of Israel, and sent to the prison to have them brought. 
But when the officers came and found them not in the prison, they returned and told, saying, The prison truly found we shut with all safety, and the keeper standing without before the door. But when we had opened, we found no man within. Now when the high priest and the captain of the temple and the chief priest heard these things, they doubted of them whereunto this would grow. They said, if these guys got out, this is going to grow. This message is going to go forward. What are we going to do? In verse 25, then came one and told them, saying, Behold, the men whom ye put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. What happened? They were told to quit saying that message after they were thrown in jail. They preached the message anyways. They were thrown in jail again. God busted the doors open and said, go stand and speak in the temple. And what's happening is saying that they went... Then they stood in the temple and they taught the people. Verse 26, Then went the captain with the officers and brought them with violence, for they feared the people. Sorry, without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should have been stoned. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did not we straightly command you that ye should not teach? In this name, and behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Verse 29 continues, and Peter's going to respond, because again, they're just affirming the same thing. Don't preach in his name. Don't preach in the temple. Don't preach publicly. Go preach it somewhere else. Go preach a different message to a different person at a different place. Just stop doing this. You're intending to bring Jesus' blood upon us. What are you doing? Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses of these things. And so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. What are they saying in here? We ought to obey God. We are his witnesses, but not only us. So also is the Holy Ghost. Are you going to fight against the Holy Ghost? Are you going to fight against God, who is blessing us with the Holy Ghost because of our obedience? Are you going to stand here and as an affront to the command of God, force us to disobey him? Oh, not so. Not so. The command from God is that every creature be preached to. Jesus, yes, has a sanctified, a set apart, a special love for the children. I believe that is because they are humble, because they are receptive, because their hearts are open to the gospel truth. They haven't been corrupted. They haven't been messed up by the world yet. So God, Jesus, wants to reach the children before they go into the hurts and hardships of sin. Before they enter into the, the death and decay that comes with living a wild and foolish life. He wants to get hold of the children before they start acting like idiots. Before they start acting like wicked little young adults. Before they grow up and become derelict people. God has a command to get to every creature. No doubt he has a set apart love for the children. Luke chapter 14 says, Go into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in. What are these highways? Well, these are the streets. What are these hedges? These are the parks. These are the forested areas. These are, these are the parts off the beaten trail. And God wants these areas to be full of the preaching and full of the invitation to come to salvation so that His house may be filled. And that's not just the house of some party as was shown in the parable. That's the house that he has in heaven for each and every one of them. And so the command is clear. The command is that you need to go and to preach to every creature. And obviously I've outlined some points of discretion, some points that we need to take note of, some points that we need to hearken unto when it comes to dealing with children. But when somebody stands before you and says things like, hey, you can't speak to these kids. Hey, you can't preach the gospel to these kids. Hey, sorry, but we have to obey God rather than men. Again, there are always room, there's always opportunity for us to be condemned for what we are doing. We don't want to open it up so that there's any room 
for appearance of evil, where somebody could see what we're doing as shady, as, as un, un, uh, un, unrighteous, as, as dark, or, or anything like that. So there's, there's obviously things that we can do as believers who are wise as serpents and harmless as doves to make sure that we are blameless in the sight of the world, right? Ask the parents' permission first. Respect authorities, right? Keep to the topic at hand when you're preaching unto children. Give space. Ensure that there's lots of witnesses, and you're not and you're not bringing up illustrations that would that would be that would be unrighteous or that would lean that way or in kind of direction like that. You know, Hollywood has enough of that stuff going to the children. We should be pure when we go to them. But regardless, we see from the examples given in Acts chapter four and Acts chapter five, when a command is given not to preach. In the, the name of Jesus, we have to disobey. We're, we're not doing it to cause trouble. We're not doing it to cause strife. We're not doing it because we want to. We we want to cross people, but we're doing it because Jesus loves the children. We're doing it because Jesus wants us to reach not just them, but every man with the gospel of Him. We want to be. Righteous. We want to obey God. We want to be his witnesses in this earth. And so we're always going to find ourselves in compromised situations where we have to be very wise concerning how we decide to react. But the bottom line is we have to find a way to preach it. We have to find a way to get it done. Look at the example of Peter. He was condemned for preaching the message, thrown in prison. They said, don't preach in the name of Jesus anymore. They let him out. He stood and he preached. They threw him in prison. The bars opened up. He was told directly by God to go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And they came to him again and cast him into prison and said to him, didn't we tell you not to preach didn't we tell you not to talk to the children? Didn't we tell you not to preach to the old folks? Didn't we tell you not to go to the native reserve? Didn't we tell you not to speak in the poor areas? Didn't we tell you not to talk about this at your workplace? Didn't we straightly charge you not to teach in his name? Behold, you have filled all Jerusalem with this doctrine. And our responsibility is to say, hey, sorry, but we ought to obey God rather than men. We are his witnesses. The Holy Ghost is his witness. And God gave the witness of the Holy Ghost to us only because we're believing him and obeying him in this very thing. So you're asking me, you're asking sound words, you're asking this church body to not <coughs> preach in his name? You're asking us to go somewhere else? You're asking us to do something else? You're asking us to preach to a different person, a different generation, a different, uh, a different ethnic group, whatever. You're contradicting and trying to oppose the word of God going forward. We are going to have to say, I ought to obey God rather than men. I ought to obey God in this thing rather than men. Obviously, Christians, we use discretion. Obviously, we are wise as serpents, harmless as doves. Obviously, there are times to just walk away from a scenario because it's better to fight another day. Pray a prayer for the person that you just got, you just got cut off from getting the gospel to. Obviously, there's times and places for getting the gospel to somebody that you normally wouldn't have the opportunity to speak to. And obviously, we need to be discreet. We need to be smart. We need to be wise in these situations, but regardless of the scenarios in which we have to preach the gospel, we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Why? Because the love of God constrains us to do that. Not only did he command us, but he constrains us to do this very thing. And this is why we have many children here in the room today, is because somebody was bold enough to preach to them, to find an opportunity to get a hold of them, to bring them out to church, to see them saved. These children go into church <coughs> or school scenarios where they're not allowed to preach the truth, and yet they do it all the same. We all go into workplaces where we're not allowed to speak the truth, and yet we do it all the same because we need to have that mentality that, hey, I understand that there's a time and place. I understand that we need to be discreet. I understand that we need to obey authorities when it comes to these types of things. But the highest authority is always going to be that of God. And there is nothing higher in his list 
of things to do than to preach the gospel to every creature, young and old, skinny or fat, rich or poor. Everybody needs to hear the gospel, and it's our responsibility to get it there. You're always going to hear, hey, you can't do that there. How many times have you heard, hey, no soliciting, right? Can you see the sign, no soliciting? Sorry, I can't help but speak this truth. Hey, you can't come into this building. It's private property. Hey, I can't help but speak the truth. Hey, you can't talk about those things. Don't you know this is a public school? I can't help but speak these things. Should I obey you, principal? Should I obey you, police officer? Should I obey you, boss? I'd love to, but you're telling me not to do what is most important to the heart of God, and that is reach the lost. He said to Peter after he had been thrown in prison twice for the same thing, he said, Go stand and speak. Go stand and speak. Just keep doing it. And God continued to bless him and to give miracles and to do things that would allow him more opportunities to do that. It would be easy for these guys to quit. But God wanted them to press on. Why? Because we ought to obey God rather than men. We are his witnesses. The Holy Ghost is working with us. And God gives us that power because we obey him in these things. And so I'm sorry. We're going to the parks. We're going to the highways. We're going to the hedges. We're going to every door because that's what God said we ought to do and we ought to obey him. Church, I implore you, be respectful. I implore you to, to know the limits and to see when authorities have stepped in and to, and to sometimes live to fight another day, right? There are times when we can just yield and give up and walk away. But there's also times when we need to stand and say, no, nope, God said do it, I gotta do it, right? To be discerning in these areas, is, is to know your Bible, okay? To know what God wants from us, to know what's important to Him, to know what His purpose is for your life. Because when the time comes, we're all going to have to make decisions where it's like, do I obey men or do I obey God? And you need to be sure. And the only way you can be sure is to know what God wants for you. And that's contained within the Scriptures. So trust Him. Obey Him. Preach the truth. Don't go around trying to be a rebel and step on every authority that's before you, right? Why is this serpent harmless? as doves, but we need to do what God says, regardless of the consequences, regardless of the people that come at us and try to say, no, go do that somewhere else. No, you can't do that here. No, go preach to somebody else. We gotta say, hey, God told me, I need to do this, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna obey him rather than men. Thank you, Father, for